You have your Bibles, again, open to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. I'm excited about our business meeting, so please stick around and attend, and afterwards we'll we'll have fellowship and the fellowship all together. My wife and I just got back from our prayer conference uh, for the state. Um, it was just a wonderful time, um, just tremendously powerful. Uh, to see hundreds of people gather together to pray at the altar and see the power of the Holy Spirit move. Um, And we are really excited to bring that back here to our church. Uh, My bishop sends his greetings to this body of believers. Today I want to talk about restricted access. You will see, I will share the vision for this year is preparing people to meet Christ face to face. It's amazing because I I see Kenny and Debbie and I know they have tremendous love for each other. And I kind of laughed when when um, when Jeff was you seem nervous. Why? (laughs) When Jeff was just saying so much about Kenny, welcome back, great to see you. Every week's about the mayor and this and that. And meanwhile, Debbie's just sitting there like she's chopped liver, you know. <laughs> We're excited to see you also. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and as much as they care and love for each other, when the Lord calls us home one day, they will have to give an answer for their lives alone. They will not stand before God as a couple. Even though our marriage represents that intimacy between us and Christ. But they will have to give an answer face to face with the Lord. Welcome back. And so will each of us. And it is my job, wholeheartedly, I believe, is to prepare you for that day. Matthew chapter 7, I'd like you to jump down to verse 21. And I want you to hear about an unprepared people. And a prepared people. Two groups, two people groups. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Lord, Lord, there's emphasis there when you see it twice. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, let let me just be clear. What is God's will for you and I? To do what? Huh? Huh? Obey. Obey. Everything you're saying is true. Obey, but as an individual, what a lot of we are all talking about are works of salvation. But if you love me, you will what? Obey me. His commandments, not Joe Whitman's, not your own. Your opinion and my opinion mean nothing. I just want to be clear. Anytime that I'm sharing the good news with somebody, the first thing, the thing that I love the most, well, I believe, and I said to them, that's the big problem. They go, what do you mean? 
Well, you made it about you. It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the God of all the universe, the creator of all things, that's what's important. What he says counts. You can have an opinion about it. Well, I don't like it. Listen, there are things in the Bible I don't like. Can I tell you? I don't like it, right? But I'm going to have to deal with it, right? Listen, I, I've had my mother, man, she, I gave her a devotional Bible. She read through the Bible in one year. How many of you have read the Bible in one year? Don't answer that. How many of you read the Bible? But anyway, we won't really get there. <laughs> Praise the Lord, brother. But really, I say to him, I said, that's the problem. Oh, God's given me eyes, and when I look at a woman, man, and he just thought, this guy starts going on, that's when I knew I lost him. Because that, at that moment, I was talking to the enemy. I said, well, you're, you're right. What your eyes are seeing is what Satan has trapped you with. And that's how I was talking to this guy. It was crazy. But that's the truth. He, he's not ready to meet Christ face to face and expect to enter heaven. And Jesus is saying here, listen to this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So somebody that say, Lord, Lord, knew him or knows about him. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me, now listen to this, this is huge, on that day. So Jesus is referring to here in Scripture, Judgment Day. When he separates people from the sheep, from the goats, as the angels do that, separate all these people, judgment day is here, the books are open, the books of life are open, the books of everything that you and I have done. Joe Whitman's turn to come up. Do I come up with Maria? No. But I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going before the judge alone. Because the blood has been applied. The books are going to be open. That's right. And everything and all the sins of my life. You ever see one of those FBI documents and they're all blacked out? Yeah. They don't use black ink in heaven. They use red. Red blood. The father's going to look. He's going to see who's standing next to me. His son. And guess what? I'm going to hear... Not guilty. Praise God. Why? Because it's the blood that has been applied. My heart is to obey my Father, to do the will of Him who has sent me to this world. It's not by accident that I'm here. It's not by accident that you're here. God's got a work for you in the world that He has placed you in, in the world that is around you. And we have to give an answer for that. I always wondered, if you were to see Jesus face to face right now, would you hide your head in shame? I have to tell you, I'm an addict. I started watching The Chosen. Has anybody watched that yet? Can I tell you something? I cry. And I cry because I have a different perspective. It's almost like I'm able to visually see Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And every time I see him doing or speaking of this, everything in me starts to weep. Not for the actor. Right. I hope you can understand that. Yeah. Yep. Right. yep. Thank you. Yes. He says, not everybody will, on that day, meaning judgment day, not everybody on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not? Now, hear this stuff. This is big stuff right here. Did we not prophesy in your name? Hello. And in your name, drive out demons. And in your name, perform many 
miracles. He says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, evildoers. So that I want you to understand that, and I've had, I've had very short debates because I've had people say to me, well, you know, these people were never saved. They were just witnesses of what was taking place and say, did we not? Wait a minute. I see nothing in scripture that supports that. What I do hear plain and clearly, Jesus saying, there will be many, and he will say, depart from me, you evildoers, I have never known you. People who lived in sin, who have fallen away, who have cast away God and have allowed their first love to grow dim. I'd rather you hot or cold, Revelation says, Jesus speaks, because if you're lukewarm, spew you out of my mouth. I don't like anything lukewarm, by the way. It's got to be hot or cold. <laughs> Room temperature water. Yeah. A lot of people like that. But we have to understand, these people thought they were ready. They thought, hey, listen, I, I, I've gone to this church my whole life. I've listened to that preacher. He's taught me this is okay. That's okay. Well, there are many pre preachers out there that are teaching so many things. Well, let me take you to something. <laughs> Jesus gives a warning. He says to them, watch out for false prophets in verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Listen, any minister who has a worldly perspective and not a biblical perspective is ungodly. We are led by the Spirit of the living God and by the Word of God. If you are promoting and saying this lifestyle is okay, that's a lie. If you're saying it's okay to, 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 you said the prayer, right? Oh, yeah, you're good. You're in. That is a lie. These are false prophets. Jesus warns in Matthew 24, many will come in my name. And he's teaching us right here, you will know them by their fruits. And how do you judge fruit? Right? We need to judge fruit by the word of God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He's not, he doesn't have a learning curve. Well, you know what? The majority of people, you know, they believe this. So guess what? You know what? I, I'm going to kind of give everybody a big curve. I hated curves in school especially for the students that worked hard and got that high grade, why should there be a curve? They earned it. They worked hard for it. Well, you know what? Many of these people believe in, in Islam and Muhammad and Buddha, you know, and do they, but yeah, they all lead to God. No, there's no curve. Jesus says, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Period. Stamp it. Shut it down. There is no learning curve. Jesus said to them, hey, guys, listen. I don't know you. You practice iniquity. You're evildoers. Maybe they're... There are shepherds there that are fle fleecing their flock. Whatever it is, Jesus says no. On the day of judgment. Now, this is the great sermon on the mount. People are sitting out there hearing this. Pharisees and Sadducees, they're hearing this. Scribes are hearing this. And we know this blew their mind away. What does it say? <coughs> 
In verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he's taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Jesus, and I'm just going to be very clear, had the anointing. The religious leaders didn't. You sense the anointing. When the anointing is there in God's word or in teaching from pastors and different ones who have the anointing to preach his good news, it does something inside, especially to ones who believe. There is no learning curve. Well, how do I know? Jump up to verse 13. And we've talked about this, and I'm, I want to drive this point home again. Matthew 7.13 says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road to dis- that leads to destruction. I want to stop there for a minute. No, let me continue. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and few find it. I want you to see the picture that Jesus just laid out for us. Two roads, two gates, two destinations, two choices, two people groups. Many find one and few find the other. Jesus teaching. And I love this. I mean, it's funny. I, I was, my wife and I were talking to some great friends recently, and they were saying to me, as we were discussing, we were talking about how many people are going to make it to heaven. Not a quantity. But just an opinion. Do you think more people are making it to heaven or hell? And their response was, oh, to heaven. Help me understand that. Because what I'm reading here in these two people groups, it says broad is the road that leads to destruction. Big is the gate. And many are entering into it. Day of judgment. And when they meet Jesus face to face, and the thing that breaks my heart, because there's going to be many good people, there's going to be many religious people. (coughs) And they're going to find themselves in a place of destruction. And we can't blame somebody else because the Spirit draws us. The Spirit drew me as a young man my whole life. And I was a wild child. Don't tell me you were a wild child, brother. You don't look like a wild child. You look gentle. No, I'm only kidding. But broad is that road. And many people are going to enter it because of deception. Because they went, what the scripture says, to a gospel that tickled their ears. We have two choices here to make. I'd like you to turn to Galatians 5 real quick. I want us to look together at God's layout. For the broad road and the wide road. I don't think, if you've ever not seen this, follow along with me. Because the choices that people are making in traveling down this road. Jesus says, many enter through this gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road. And people are just walking in without any discernment whatsoever. I mean, can, have you ever talked about, to people about what they believe in heaven? 
I'll figure it out when I get there. No, you won't. You're going to miss the mark by the time you get there if you don't figure it out now. Why aren't you taking your kids to Sunday school? Why are you not teaching them about God? Well, I'm going to let them make their choice when they get older. No, it's your choice. It's your responsibility to raise your kids in the faith. It's on you. They've been entrusted to you. They're treasured. Did you see this guy last week? Pastor? You were what, sister? 12, honey? How many has he got? 15? How many has he got? 13? I don't believe any is. I can't even keep the, neck, the, the, the record straight. The, the, I am blown away at every one of these kids. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm like, and when we were talking to their mother and father, my wife and I were sharing, and, and it was getting later. Everybody had left the church. Do you know what the oldest children did? They went to the car. They, put out some, they pulled out some kind of board game. They got all the kids around the tables, and they started to play. They never even asked their mother or father. They never uh, were whining about being there or wanting to go home or this and that. Am I right? We were talking about this. Never once did mom give the kids a dirty look or dad give the dirty looks or say, I'm going to get you when I get home, you know. Why? Because they raised their children that way. Their sons that are in college, they're in four of them that are in college now. Well, the fourth, Noah is going. They looked in. I know the story. Three of them are in college now. Noah's going. They're in their father's old alma mater in Indiana, and their one's going to Texas. All right? You want anything else? I'll talk to you more about it later. And they're all like, we're ready for the mission. And they're good-looking kids. I have to be careful with this term. It's the only term I know that really describes this studs, these boys. And the girls are knocking at the door. Because they go to very, very, they're Baptists. They go to very strict churches. The girls, all dresses, this and that. And the father says to each one of his sons, you need to tell them the expectations. What's expected of their wives? Because they're very clear on, I am on the mission field. In their early 20s, him and his wife went to Bulgaria. God called them to Bulgaria. She went right along. They didn't even know how to speak the language. What I'm saying is it's our responsibility to raise these kids. And many of them are not being raised. They're not knowing faith. They're not knowing anything. I praise God for my mom and my dad. At least, you know, even though we were raised in Catholicism, I, I had a foundation given to me. I understood God. I understood Jesus. I understood angels and Mary and, and the biblical stories. Galatians 5, go down to 13. My brothers and sisters, we were called to be free. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. But rather what? Let me just stop something and, and say something about freedoms. I want you to understand, when you were a worldly individual, whether you recognize it or not, you are a slave to sin. And the moment that you gave Jesus Christ your heart, confessed him in Lord, and started following his way, guess what? You were freed from sin. Yes. I am no longer a slave. I make a choice. If I don't want to do it, I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me to overcome any temptation that comes into my life. That's why the Bible teaches us, captivate every thought. Put it on the microscope of scripture. I, can I tell you something? But before Christ, I was a slave to sin. I gave in to sin all the time. So Paul's saying, listen, you guys are free. You've been freed from sin. But he says, don't, don't use that to indulge in the flesh. In other words, don't abuse God's grace. When you're stuck in habitual sin, let me tell you something. You're a sinner again. You've made that choice to live that life. Jesus didn't make that choice for you. He says, I've freed you. And I've given you all power and authority to get out of this.
He says, rather, don't indulge in the flesh. I love this. Serve one another in humility. <laughs> it goes back to the two greatest commandments. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Serve one another. What? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So I say, now here's the kicker. Walk in the Spirit. So guess what? That Walk in the Spirit. You're traveling down the road. You get that? <clears throat> so I say to you, walk by the Spirit... And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to stop there for a minute. So we're walking down a road. Okay, as we read in <coughs> verse 13 of Matthew 7, there's a broad road, right? Much access on a broad road, right? It's wide. You got elbow room. You got freedom. You got all these people around you walking aimlessly down this road. You ever, you ever see what they've done? Psychologists have proven this. If, if you go to a, a building in Buffalo, a tall building, and you start looking up and you just start pointing, do you see that? Everybody, else. Everybody. So uh, I want you to understand something, but it's true. Everybody else will start coming around you and looking up. And I've had people tell me, man, can you not see what's going on in that church? It is growing in leaps and bounds. Well, first of all, I want you to remember this. Crowds attract crowds. And understand, what are they teaching in that church matters. Because the broad road are filled with people Filled with people, listen to me. So I say to you, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So there's two decisions, two roads. You see that? They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Restrictions. Restrict access. You are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So I just want to be clear about something. One road is broad, broad and wide, big gate. Everybody is just like aimlessly walking in. Why? Because everybody else is. But the narrow road is restrictive. You can't do what you want. You can't get away with it. You ever hear kids say, I live in a strict home? Praise the Lord. Yeah. Too often we let our kids, well, you know, we have to let them grow. You don't let them grow wild. You, gotta, you, gotta, you want a beautiful plant, you got to trim it. You got to take care of it. You got to cultivate it. When something is, is attacking it, you clean it out. So I want you to understand, when the Bible talks about a narrow road, he's talking about something that's very uncomfortable. I don't like anything narrow. I don't like anything restricting. But the narrow road is uncomfortable because it's contrary to our flesh. It is restricting just by nature. It has restrictions. It is narrow. And only one person can work down, walk down that road, and it is you. There's not enough room for a crowd. <clears throat> See, on the broad road, he then goes on to give examples. <clears throat> Verse 19, he says, on this road, the wide road, the flesh things are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. Sound familiar? Is that not the world? 
idolatry. Everything's an idol to everybody. The stinking cell phone's an idol. It's all about me, my feelings, what I care about, what I want to do. I'm watching people literally change from a woman to a man. My wife, we, we, yesterday when we were at the hotel, I mean, here's this girl, cute little thing, dressing like more manly and having facial hairs grow. And I, I mean, and this was, you know, she was changing. She was taking hormones. There's no doubt. I'm like, what are you doing? Romans 1 clears all of that up, guys. Genesis clears that all up, man. I, I made them male and female. God didn't just oops and put you in the wrong body. I'm just being clear. Impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy. And if this is in your life, guys, this is a measuring tool. If you have a spirit of jealousy... There's an issue. If you have acts of rage, well, I get angry. Listen to me. If you're getting angry and there's a, an outbite screaming, raging, there's a problem. If you got a problem with lust and sexual morality, if you keep going to that computer or that cell phone or something's happening, broad road, guys. What are you going to say to Jesus when he asks you about those things face to face? If you've got a lying spirit, what are you going to say to him face to face? Well, I only did it once in a while. Well, do you want to go to the books and look? Selfish ambitions, dissension, factions. It sounds like the world. This is the world we live in. Listen to what else he says. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this, very clear. Any other preacher telling you differently is a liar. Anyone who lives like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We need to be a trumpet to the world. We need to be a trumpet to people in other churches that might think all of these things are okay because the pastor says so. But God's a God of love. Yes! But God is also a righteous and a holy God. And he's given us our word and he's told us what good things we can do and what bad. And he just said this whole list, this is just a small list. If you're doing any of these things and living any of these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You are one of those going, Lord, Lord, did we not depart from me? I don't know you. You practice these things. You put yourself on this broad road. And you're entering this wild, this wide gate. And, and guess what? Man, you didn't follow any of my restrictions. See, to the kingdom, he says, few find it. See, to find something, and you heard me say, we got to search it. We need to have access to that restricted area. Nobody has access unless they have the code. What gives us access? A life filled with these things. Here's the narrow road, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, uh-oh. John 15, right? You need to be fruitful. Any branch that's not fruitful, right, that's in the vine, uh-oh. Who's the vine? Right, who's the branches? People who cry out, Lord, Lord. And if you're not fruitful, what does the gardener do? Throws it to the side, right? And then eventually it ends up where? Okay. Can we see what Jesus is saying here? About the roads, about the gates. And he goes on, and Paul gives such a beautiful description of what we should look like. He says, listen, the, few, the fruit of the Spirit is this, is love, is joy, 
is peace, is long-suffering, is kindness, is goodness, it's faithfulness. Hear me. It's gentleness. It's a person of what? Self-control. See, the world is out of control. God's people are supposed to be in control. Well, pastor, you had no idea what that guy did to me. I wasn't letting him get away with that. Really? Did he hit you? Did he do this? No, but I gave him a piece of my mind. Well, is that a person of self-control? I'm going to tell you, one day I, I, I sat as a state overseer for our organization, and I had to go meet with a young man who was going to take over a church, and I, I ended up getting a call because all of a sudden the, the, the church body, the pastor, the the pastor's wife, the previous pastor who passed away, his wife was still attending the church, and she had concerns about this young man spending the church's money. So, okay, let's go take a look. He showed me the books, and there was definitely reason for concern. And I met with this young man. There came a point in that meeting, he was screaming at me, pointing his finger in my face, and yelling at me like you can't imagine. And I sat there with my legs crossed, my hands on my lap. Didn't say a word. There was a slight battle in my flesh. Slight battle. A few thoughts entered my mind. Well, Lord, if I was to send him to you now, <laughs> would he be going to hell and would I be going to hell? <laughs> no. But I will say there was a slight battle, yeah, of course. but it never won out. Yeah, it was greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Right. I had self-control. Now, do I have self-control all the time? No, but then you need to repent. Mm -hmm. I'm not living in habitual <laughs> sin. You're not living in habitual sin. Paul talks about the members of our body, how we wage against them, the flesh that's in this world. We live in a sinful world. One day we're not going to have to deal with this stuff. We're going to go into heaven. It's pure. It's holy. We're not going to have these fleshly bodies to contend with anymore. Sin is just going to be eradicated. But we still, as Paul talks about, we fight with the members of our body. But, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, what a true believer looks like on that narrow, restricted road are, is this, that you're filled with love, you're filled with joy, you're filled with kindness and long-suffering and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He goes, against such things, there is no law. I can't condemn you if you live like this, but I can condemn you if you live on the wide, a wild road, the wide road, the wild one too. Against such things is no Lord's. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. To do that is to live a disciplined, holy life. Not anything goes. And that requires choices. It requires to submit yourself unto the Lord. Let thy will be done and obey his commandments. Don't be deceived. There is no judgment. There is no day of judgment where you can say to the Lord, they sent me here. No. Nope. It was that pastor. No. My spirit was calling you, but you, you liked that. You liked living on the broad road. Wouldn't most people, let's be honest with you, if we gave in to the desires of the flesh... The Bible says that sin is good for a what? Season. Season. Then comes what? Death. Death. Is this good stuff? Yes. I kind of like this. Let me continue. <laughs> First Corinthians 13. I want to talk more about this fruit. Love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. He told us to love our neighbor, right? 
to serve our neighbor humbly? Humbly. <laughs> I'm thinking of Pastor Ralph's church. <laughs> love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love, what? It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. I never dishonored that other young man. Listen, that was one of the biggest trials of my life. I love this. It does not dishonor. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Let me say this again, ladies. I remember what you did July 13th, 1982. It was, it was a nice day. It was 68 degrees. You were wearing that flannel shirt with the holes, you know, the one I don't like that you still have. And you spoke these words to me that were not so... Come on, we got to let it go every once in a while. I'm in trouble when my wife says, do you remember? Oh, no, I don't. Sorry, baby. And she'll look at me convenient. Listen, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Can you see this? Can you see this pattern? This restricted road that we're on, it requires such change in us. Why? Because the only way to have access is to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and to live a life that's acceptable to him. Are you going to be perfect like this? One day you will be. But we need now to strive for it. He says in the next verse, love never fails. That's our gold member card. Love never fails. So in verse 24, if you go back to me to Matthew 7, and we're going to wrap this up. <coughs> Therefore, I'll give you a moment. I hear a few things rattling out there. Mr. G back there has got an awesome Bible now. He's got all the tabs in it that show you where all the books of the Bible are in. I love that. Verse 34, and this is right after he talks to everybody about, I never knew you, away from me, you're evildoers. Listen to what he says here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does what? Puts them into practice. Puts them into your life. It becomes a lifestyle. It becomes who you are. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the what? The rock. We're solid. We're good. We're on a road and a path. There's no, there's no traps. There's no snares. It's solid. It's restricted. Don't come off the path. I love driving down these roads, and I'm nervous sometimes when I'm in my vehicle, and, you know, and I see all that white out there from the salt, right? We know there was ice, and you always come around turns because you know if you slide off roads in western New York, you're ending up in a ditch or in a head-on collision with somebody. If you find it, that small gate, that narrow road, and the way we find it is by obeying, by putting into practice these things. See, I do not want to meet Jesus face to face, and I have something in my closet I've been hiding. I don't want to meet Jesus face to face and have some kind of lifestyle that I am practicing that is that is evil in the sight of God, but nobody else knows about.
Because I'm going to tell you who does know about it. He does. God is not mocked. Well, it's not hurting anybody. Yes, it is. It's hurting you and your relationship with Jesus Christ. He's calling for a bride without spot, without wrinkle. See, we have restricted access, man. Right, going down that narrow path requires, requires some discipline. It is not easy. We can't waver too far. Because if you hit an ice patch, whew, I tell everybody, well, you know, Pastor, you, you know, you, know you, you had some tough times in your life in, the, in years past. I said, yeah. I'm going to tell you very clearly, the devil had an ace up his sleeve. And he was going to wait for the right time. And so all of a sudden, Pastor Joe decided, man, I, I, need, to get, I need to fix all of this. And the devil just looked and says, man, I've had this guy for so long, I need to try to destroy him and destroy his family. And he did a pretty good, good job about destroying a lot of things, but I'm still standing Amen. by God's grace. But he whipped out that ace in his sleeve. Listen, one day God spoke to me in a prayer meeting on Monday because I carried such guilt. And the Lord said to me, he says, you did everything that a man or a woman needs to do to be restored Amen. from sin, just like David did. Yes, yes. Confession, repentance, turn from, whatever you need to do. So he says, I want you to be that kind of testimony. Yep. Yes. But the enemy has a an ace up his sleeve to bring disaster. So when you start making your life straight, guess what? The enemy is going to try his best to rip you apart, to rip your family apart. But stand. Because it's going to be all worth it one day when you meet the Lord face to face. And I'm, I'm like this. I'm, I'm walking a path like this right now. But can I tell you something? Paul said it. But you're free. There's a part of me that has such freedom and liberty I can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. I've never had the depth of freedom that I have today, and it's all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's all because of obeying his commandments. It's all because I want to live a holy life. I want to live one that pleases the Father because I want access to him. And here's the kicker. The Bible says that we have not seen the fullness of the Lord yet. We haven't. But one day at the end of that road, as I enter that gate, everything that was not known will be made known to me. Yep. The fullness of God's glory will be surrounding me, in me, through me, but I have access now. You have access to that glory now. Maybe not in its fullness. See, I believe for our church, and I'm going to end in a minute because we're going to go into the business meeting because this is kind of like going there. But I believe for our church that we are going to have access to God's glory this year like never before. Yes. Amen. Amen. Am I right, honey? We both believe that, wholeheartedly believe that. I believe this is going to be a year that we're going to see God's glory manifest in his power and his might like never before. And guess what? I don't know how. But one thing I know is your stepson, he's going to feel God's power and glory break him. Listen, I am believing, brother, that God will heal your body. Amen. I am believing that God is going to be setting the captives free. Yep, that's right. mm -hmm. And we are going to see the fullness. We can't even comprehend. I believe that, man, one day we're going to see revival like never before. Yeah. Can, can, so South Korea. I don't know if you've ever heard of Prayer Mountain in yes. South Korea. Yes. Okay, we, some of you know about this. What, what's the pastor's name? I'm not good with I know his last name is Cho. What is his full name? 
David Cho, I mean, we've read some of his books. Just unbelievable, right? We just found out that Korea, South Korea, is sending missionaries here. Prayer teams. Listen, to, I want you, you got to hear this, guys, because we're going to be a part of this. We actually met with Doug Small, who has access to all of this. And I'm like, hey! I wasn't like that, but I was <laughs> inside. I was like that. And you know what the funniest thing was? The bishop, as, as at, it was before one of the service, he grabbed me. He goes, he goes, Pastor Joe, I want you and your wife to come into the room because afterwards they, they have a small meal for all the guest speakers. He says, I want you and your wife to come in. I'm like, Bishop, you don't know my wife. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding because we got in there. And we sat down. There's some people I love and we know. And we started talking. And my wife's like, can we go over there now? Can we go over there now? Can we go? It's like that kid. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And she wanted to go over to the table and start to speak to Bishop Doug Small, who I know. I've, I've met with him in the past. And he's a great guy, all about prayer. We went over there. We sat with him. There's a team coming to Buffalo. I said, we want a team in, in, in Niagara Falls. He says, I'm going to give you access to the people that are working in Buffalo with these teams. He says, you can have access. You can, I'm going to get you to meet with them. I'm going to send you all their information because these people know how to pray. He says, the last time these people came to America, he says, when they got picked up, they didn't want to go to the, they didn't want to go to the hotel. Guess where they wanted to go? They wanted to go to the church and start praying. Right away, waste no time. And guess why? Because they know in their little country, they're surrounded by North Korea, they're surrounded by China, they're surrounded by Russia, and they know if America falls, South Korea falls. And they're coming here to pray for us not to fall. Praise God. Can you imagine? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. 20 teams last year, this year, 40 teams. 40 cities in America, and one of the cities is Buffalo. I'm going to hijack a small team and bring him to our church. Listen, we don't know what God's going to do. That's right. But I remember a prophetic word that your sister had given during one of our prayer meetings. It's never left me. So we were praying, we were interceding, and all of a sudden she was given a vision from the Lord. And she says, I see angels all with flaming swords on the edge along the whole river, all the way down through the falls. And they were stepping from the river inland and taking back the land for the Lord. Praise God. Wow. And so I believe and we believe that this is going to happen. But the only way to have access to the Father is for us to be on that narrow road. Mm -hmm. Is to live a life that's obedient to his commandments. There needs to be intentionality in our lives to be called a Christian. Their need to be intentionality to say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? I obey him because I love him. That's right. If the Bible says not to, it needs to be part of me to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's right. Can I tell you something? I want you to remember this. There's one thing that we're guaranteed, and that is to stand before the throne room of God one day, one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. You can think you're running now. You can think you're hiding now. You can have every excuse in the world. You can continue to listen to the devil and his lies of how he's trying to dismember you, to take you apart, and to make it all about you. Woe me, woe me, woe me, oh me, mo. I'm this, I'm hurting, I'm this, I'm that. Do you know what's happening in my life? What? Stop woeing yourself. Let, let me just tell you something. That only can go so far, but we're going to be facing God one day. And he has commanded us to pull up our bootstraps and to get on that narrow road. Because anything else is a broad road that leads to destruction. Let's all pray together.
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I just give you your saints. And Father, we have two roads, two gates, two people groups. We have two choices. And what I understand in these two places, these two destinations, in one, many will find it and enter it. And that's the one that leads to destruction. And the other, though, it says that few will find it. That's pretty clear. Those are your words, Jesus, not my words. We have to be searching out and we have to be intentional about finding it. You talk, you talk about that pearl of, of great wealth, Lord. Would we not sell everything to buy that great pearl? And if we knew that there was a great treasure in a field, would we not sell everything to buy that land? Father, you were using these parables, these examples to say that's, that's what we need to do. We need to be willing to give up everything for you. Our wants, our desires, our possessions. And can I say this? We have to be able to give up our time. So, Father, I know for a fact that your word has tucked at the cords of our heart today. And I'm grateful for that, Lord. I'm so grateful how you have been stringing the, and, and plucking the cords of my heart in so many ways. I'm grateful, Lord. I'm grateful for deliverance. I'm grateful for your great sacrifice. I'm grateful for the power of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I'm grateful for, for what you have done and continue to do in my life. Now I pray that, Lord, you would sh just strum at the cords of everyone's heart here today. Holy Spirit, speak to them. Some might hear you're doing great, but, and you, uh, uh, but I need you to change in this area. Just like, Father, you spoke to the churches in the book of Revelation. You see, you, you know, for a lot of them, you have all of this that is good, but you lack in these areas. And you're in jeopardy of losing your candlestick. So, Father, I believe your Holy Spirit is talking to us today. Preparing us, Father, to receive what you have for us. And Father, may our eyes be open to the, the clear fact that this is a very narrow road, a restricting road. And, and the things that I, I, I spoke today out of your word in Galatians 5.22, to live these kind of fruits, we can't do it on our own because our flesh desires other things. And the only way that we can accomplish living by the fruit of the Spirit or living in the purity of your love is by being connected to your glory. Show us that, Father. Show us that. So we worship you and we thank you and we ask to, that, Lord, you would bless your people, keep them, strengthen them, move them by your word till you bring us back to your house again, Lord. Let us be a light in a world filled with darkness. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Guys, in less than 10 minutes,